69 AD, Emperor Nero lays dead, killed by his own hand. For the first time since the murder of Julius Caesar, Rome is left without an heir to the throne. A power struggle erupts between the empire's top generals, who turn their armies on each other in a bloody bid for power. The ultimate victor is Vespasian, a simple, straight-talking general who had commanded Rome's legions in the volatile Jewish outpost of Judea. He is not of royal blood, and he is nothing like his tyrannical predecessor. Vespasian was the anti-Nero. Uh, he was uh, as different from Nero as one could possibly get. He had come up through the ranks, and he was a practical, kind of hard-bitten man who was averse to pretension and proud of it. Vespasian's the kind of guy that would much rather watch a football game than an opera. Unlike Nero, who exploited the skills of his engineers for his own colossal vanity projects, Vespasian would put Rome's greatest architectural minds to work for the people. He would start by draining the massive lake that Nero had built on his palace grounds. On that site would rise Rome's most famous engineering marvel, a place where all the chaos that had consumed the city could be channeled. It would be called the Flavian Amphitheater, though we know it as the Colosseum. So the statement that Vespasian made was, I am taking a space which is only for the private use of a bad emperor, and now I'm transforming that area into a public space which will be then used for the enjoyment of all the people of Rome. So that was a very bold uh, piece of propaganda. Gladiators have been spilling blood in the name of entertainment for centuries. But the people of Rome were hungry for bigger, bolder spectacles. The Colosseum would give the gladiators a permanent, state-of-the-art killing field, and the games would take on a level of carnage never before seen in the Empire's history. But this was the big venue. This was the Superdome. The entertainment came to you. Everything from animals from the farthest corners of the known world to captives from faraway lands could be brought to your central location, to your favorite box seat, and right in the center of the city. Construction on the Colosseum began in 72 AD. It was financed by the sale of precious relics taken from the Jewish temple during Vespasian's sacking of Jerusalem. Twelve thousand Jewish captives were brought back from that campaign to build the amphitheater. They would have worked under tremendously harsh conditions and been worked long and hard and to the end. They poured more than 6,000 tons of concrete and hauled huge travertine building blocks to the site from a quarry 20 miles away. As the building progressed up higher, they would use less of the strong, expensive, and heavy limestone and more of the cheaper ingredients, which were lighter in weight. The Romans had quite sophisticated wooden cranes and, and devices for lifting stones, and they'd be able to do that quite easily uh, from the ground and up to great heights. In just eight years, the imposing structure grew to 160 feet tall, dwarfing all that surrounded it. It's the tallest ancient Roman structure ever built. This is the amphitheater of the capital. So what was Rome? Rome was a city that was so much larger than any other city. It was so much richer. So that came to symbolize the power, the engineering, the wealth of ancient Rome. Roman amphitheaters were constructed from a surprisingly simple framework, incorporating two Greek theaters back to back to form one 360-degree theater in the round. The Colosseum set a new standard for Roman amphitheater design. 
It contained an intricate network of corridors and staircases that could shuffle 70,000 Romans in and out in record time. As with stadiums today, everyone who entered the Colosseum had a ticket corresponding to the number above one of the entry gates. The complex was designed not only to control the crowds, but to keep them comfortable. It had 110 drinking fountains and two restrooms, large enough to accommodate a packed house. The Colosseum even had a retractable roof. On hot days, an awning called a valerium was unfurled above the upper deck to shade spectators from the sun. It was operated by sailors from the Roman Navy, who were stationed around the top of the Colosseum's arcade. They could move it according to the sun and according to the wind. And subsequently, the Colosseum was amazingly air-conditioned, shaded, and they would stand on top of the arcade and work these poles, the holes of which we can see in the external side, that would hold this immense canvas that would cover the place. By 80 AD, the Colosseum was complete. But Vespasian didn't live to see the grand opening of his greatest monument. He had died of natural causes the previous year. So his son and successor, Titus, led the inaugural celebration. For 100 straight days, Romans flocked to the Colosseum to soak in every kind of carnage imaginable. 5,000 animals were slaughtered in a single day thousands of gladiators and prisoners left as corpses. Outside the arena, bloodshed on this scale was known only in war. But inside, it was pure entertainment. They go for the entire day. And in the morning, they watch men kill or be killed by uh, animals. And around noontime, they're watching the execution of prisoners. And then finally, in the afternoons from the main event, primetime TV kind of experience is the best for last, and that's going to be gladiators, man against man. Gladiatorial fights were a big draw at the Colosseum, but they weren't always the main event. Several ancient writers described live naval battles recreated right in the middle of the arena with battleships on water. It would have been entirely possible to have diverted water from one of the aqueducts and brought it to the Colosseum in order to flood the floor to a shallow depth. We do have evidence due to recent studies of the Colosseum that show there are plenty of channels, water channels, for flooding in the substructures of the Colosseum. So yes, it was possible, and yes, it happened. Cristiano Ranieri is the first modern archaeologist to explore the labyrinth of water channels beneath the Colosseum. He believes he has found conclusive evidence of a plumbing system that was used to flood the arena for naval battles. We have found underneath the arena floor some tunnels that are very ancient, even more ancient than the Colosseum, that date from the time of Nero, therefore contemporary to the Domus Aurea. The original water channels built beneath Nero's artificial lake were left intact when the Colosseum was built above it. They could have been reconfigured to flood and drain the arena. In this never-before-seen footage, Cristiano leads his dive team inside those ancient channels and through water polluted with the debris of two millennia. Beneath the Colosseum, he uncovers a holding tank with a direct line to a nearby aqueduct. Cristiano believes water was diverted from that aqueduct into the arena. He also finds evidence of drain pipes that connected to the city sewer system, which could have been used to drain the floodwaters from the arena into the Tiber River. <laughs> 